chances are you've traveled out of your home city. You've probably been outside of your home state or province, and there's a pretty good chance that you've also been outside of your home country. If you've traveled around, you've probably noticed that people from different regions behave and speak a little differently, and they have different mannerisms and values and social customs. These differences might not be super obvious if you travel to just the next town over or the next state or province over, but these differences become pretty stark and obvious when you travel far away to a distant country, especially a country that's on a different continent than the one that you live on. The point I'm trying to make is that human population groups have different social behaviors and different cultural norms. Researchers wanted to see if this was also true for our nearest cousins, the chimpanzees. Specifically, they wanted to understand intraspecific variation in sociality. They wanted to compare the behaviors and the cultural norms of chimpanzee populations. So for two years, they looked at the social behaviors of chimps in four different population groups, like their grooming tendencies, their feeding habits, their one-on-one -on -one behaviors, and their behavior within a larger group. They saw patterns that applied to all the population groups, like the frequency of socialization events. They found that in smaller populations, socialization was more common, and chimps were more likely to get to know their tribesmates and engage in grooming. In larger tribes, the chimps were actually a little less likely to participate in socializing. This is interesting because it mirrors human behavior. Humans in smaller towns are more likely to know and interact with their neighbors than they are in larger towns. In really big cities with hundreds of thousands or millions of people, it's quite likely that you could have zero personal relationship with any of your proximal neighbors. So just as the size of the population influences human behavior, it also seems to influence chimpanzee behavior. But there were also differences seen between the chimp populations. For example, in some populations, the chimps were more social. They grouped up more often and for longer periods of time so as to socialize and groom each other and generally interact in positive ways. Other populations were less friendly, and the resident chimps in these populations tended to group together for shorter periods of time, and they had more frequent negative encounters, like conflicts or squabbles over food or something. In the researchers' experiment, they were observing four different population groups of chimps. Populations 1 and 3 tended to form smaller social groups, and they had a relatively low degree of clustering. But despite these immediate similarities, population group 1 tended to show high social differentiation. Or, to put it another way, it had a much more socially hierarchical culture, whereas population 3 was more egalitarian. The chimps in population 1 had less social cohesion. They moved relatively frequently between their small groups, and they didn't engage in as much grooming behavior. The chimps in population 3 had much more social cohesion, with a little less moving between these social groups, and a little more time spent hanging out and grooming. Population 2 was huge, and it exhibited a cultural structure that was similar to a high-population human city, similar to population 1. They showed high modularity and very high social differentiation, you know, a very, a very stark social hierarchy. So the chimps in population 2 were forming cliques based on social status within a very large crowd. They stayed close to their clique and groomed each other relatively infrequently, and they changed cliques infrequently. Frankly, population 2 sounds a little stressful and competitive. Now the last group, population 4, had a decent population size and a relatively small habitat, so they were all somewhat nestled together in close proximity, and they engaged in frequent grooming and they got to know each other very well. There was a very low degree of social differentiation and modularity, which would suggest that Population 4 had a pretty relaxed and chill culture. They were pretty relaxed with one another, and they spent the bulk of their time being close together in a warm, fuzzy heap, picking bugs out of each other's hair. Now, this might not sound like fun to you as a human, but if you're a chimp, that's quite a wonderful afternoon, so it seems like these guys in Population 4 had the right idea. Now, on an individual level, each chimp has its own distinct personality, and this personality and their position in the social hierarchy can contribute to the total meta-behavior of the group. 
For example, if dominant males are aggressive and not charitable, then this aggressive, not charitable behavior is likely to be spread throughout the tribe and be reinforced. The critical nuance here can only be seen with long-term observation. If the culture changes when an individual dies, then that would imply that the changed behaviors were a product of the personal influence of that individual chimp who is now dead. And because they're dead, their influence isn't affecting the culture anymore, and so you can see that the culture will change. But if the cultural norms and the chimp's behavior generally stays the same as the old individuals die and new ones are born, then that would imply that the behavior is more deeply rooted at a population level, and it's not the product of an individual exerting its influence over the others. When the researchers took a step back and they looked at all of the chimp populations as a whole and all of their behaviors, they reasoned that the observed social differences between these populations were largely cultural. The chimps are all in the same kind of habitat, which controls for the ecological theory of animal behavior, and they're all from the same species, so you have minimal genetic variation that might you know, throw a wrench into the machinery here, so that really leaves culture as the only thing to explain the differences between these chimps' population groups. These chimps have their own distinct culture. And the really interesting question becomes how the chimps abstract this culture in their own minds, how they perceive their own culture, how they perceive the actions and the behaviors of other chimps within this cultural paradigm. And it also makes you wonder what would happen if a chimp is transplanted from one population to another, how they would react in this different culture. It makes me wonder what would happen if you took a chimp from population 4, where the culture really emphasizes close proximity and frequent grooming, and you transplanted that individual chimp into population 1 or population 2, where there's a much stricter social hierarchy and the chimps aren't nearly as friendly with each other. I wonder if that transplanted chimp would experience some kind of culture shock and would maybe experience depression because they're no longer experiencing that close physical comfort and the grooming that they got in their, uh, in their original culture. These are all really interesting questions, and they can only be explored with further research. And one of the reasons why I think this animal behavior research is so interesting is because it can tell us a lot about ourselves. It can give us clues as to how human culture may have originated and developed, and it might be able to help us explain why we have the cultures that we have today. Obviously, these are questions that involve much more than just purely biological variables. You have geography, you have uh, conflict, politics, ideology, religion, all sorts of stuff that comes into play when you're talking about human cultures. But by no means does this reduce the value of these chimpanzee culture studies, because by studying chimpanzee culture, we can get a look into the very primitive roots of human culture, 